all there. That you have been extremely good to us. And that we must testify to the fact even when we have not been good to you. Well, this morning, Lord, we have come because we want to hear a word from you. Something that will not just take us through the day or the week, but something, Lord, that will carry us throughout the years of our lives. And so, Lord, take the preacher, allow him to be lost within the shadow of the cross. For the Bible says, if Jesus and only Jesus is lifted up, all men, and we include women and children, will be added to you. Lord, that's our desire. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Without any stretch of the human imagination, Whitley Houston would be considered an icon for many generations. Though she has passed on, her music will be long remembered. But in one of her songs that moved the hard chords of many, she asked the question, where do broken hearts go? Can they find their way home? Back to the arms of a love that's waiting there. And if somebody loves you, won't they always love you? I looked in your eyes, and I know that you still care for me. It doesn't really matter how long you can live on this earth. In time, somebody's going to break your heart. I remember I was in the fourth grade. That's the first time my heart was broken. <laughs> I had a crush on a little girl there at Bethany School. And back in the day, we didn't have phones so we could text. Neither could we send email. So we had a process. The process was simple. You just write on a note. So I did my sophistication. And I wrote on a note, do you like me? Check yes or check no. She checked no. My heart was crushed, and uh, my heart was broken. But life has taught me, just like it has taught many of you, it's better to have your heart broken when you're young than to have your heart broken when you have age. Because it's easier to rebound when you're young. But when you're old, it's hard to rebound and start over. The Bible says in Psalms 147, beginning with verse 1, it says, Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto God. For it is pleasant, and that praise is comely. Verse 2. The Lord doth build up Jerusalem and gather together the outcast of Israel. And verse 3, He healeth the broken in heart, and bindeth up the wounds. In this profound text of scripture, there are three things that David says we ought to praise God for. The first one is in verse 2 and verse 2a, where it says, the Lord built up Jerusalem. In other words, we need to praise God for building up His church. Can I get a witness? Amen. The Bible also says in Psalms 127 and verse 1, Except the Lord build the house, what happens? They labor in vain that do what? That build it. Number two, I like this part. Verse 2a, it says, He gathered together the outcasts of Israel. God go 
goes after the backslider. Do we have anybody here that used to be a backslider? That God ran after you and brought you back? Anybody here? At least you ought to say hallelujah. Come on, say amen. Because you know what your life was like. Before God brought you back into the church, can I get a witness? But now your life, your lifestyle, and your testimony should tell others who are backsliders, who are trying to find their way back home. Now the best place to be is in the house of the living God. Now, the Bible says this, He healeth the broken in heart. And then the Bible says, And bindeth up their wounds. Now here comes the profound question. Anybody here ever had your heart broken? <laughs> Has anyone ever left you wounded? Yes. Are you today carrying scars of being bruised and broken because of what someone did to you Yesterday, mm -hmm. Psalms chapter 73 and verse 26. And I want you to remember this text because this is a profound text of Scripture. The Bible says this in verse 26. My flesh and my heart. What's the next word? <laughs> I'm going to say it one more time. My flesh and my heart do what? Yeah. Watch this. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion for how long? Now, ladies and gentlemen, look at me. We're in an age of relationships. We're in an age where people are having challenges connected. So you're going to find a lot of you and me. They're going to find situations where people are going to hurt us, break us, disappoint us, bruise us, leave us wounded, leave us on the side of the road to bleed by ourselves, then turn around and ask, can they help you? Can I get a witness? But I want you to understand, no matter what you have gone through, no matter what experience you have been through, my Bible is clear. God is your strength and your portion. Can I hear you say hallelujah? Come on, church, let me hear you say hallelujah. God is your strength. Everybody say strength. And your portion. Everybody say portion. In other words, you got plenty of promises for you. So always remember the joy of the Lord is your strength. Whatever you're feeling down, God got your back. Whatever broken up, God can put you together. He specializes. Can I get a witness? You see, too many of us, when we are broken up in pieces, we focus on one piece and feel that this one piece is okay, it'll put me back together. But ladies and gentlemen, never focus on one aspect of your life. You're made up of a whole lot of pieces. Can I get a witness? Let God handle all the pieces because he can put you back together. And I got news for you. Once he puts you back together, yeah. you will never be the same again. Yeah. You know what? In fact, you'll be a lot better before you were, before you were broken. Can I get a witness? Yeah. Because I got news for you. A difficult situation yeah. should give you enough wisdom yeah. on how to live your life. Yeah. Can I get a witness? Yeah. You need to say, Lord, I thank you. Come on, say that. Lord, I thank you. It's a hard saying, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Once we've been torn up, broken up, torn apart, to turn around and say, Lord, I thank you. Mm -hmm. When deep in our heart you know, Lord, I know I'm supposed to say thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know if I can get it out today. <laughs> and I want you to know God understands. Yeah. But once he gets you over that hill, yeah. Get you past that hump. Get you through that valley. Can I get a witness? Because always remember, God is more concerned about your character than your comfort. Some of you need to write that one down. He is more concerned with your character.
character, everybody say character. character. He is more concerned with your character than he's concerned about your comfort. Can I get a witness? God understands. And always remember this before I go to our next text. Always remember this. It is how you respond to God in your valley that determines how long you're going to last in the valley. Amen. It is how you respond to your God in the valley that determines how long you're going to be in the valley. You got that? Now let me break that down for you. Once that trial is on your back, yes. if all you're doing is complaining and fussing and doubting God and fighting God, can I get a witness? Oh, yes. Guess what God's going to do? Leave him in that valley a little longer. Can I get a witness? Because God puts us through things so that we will learn certain things. Can I get a witness? Because he's concerned about our character. Janetta Barris, one of my favorite authors, wrote a book entitled, What Happened to Daddy's Little Girl? And she approaches the idea of fatherless daughters in America. There's an increase today of single parenthood. In fact, there are over 24 million children in this country alone who are living without their fathers. There are many characteristics of fatherlessness. The mother passes the values and the attitudes that define the condition to her daughter. And her daughter, in turn, wills it to her daughter like a family heirloom. The source of this particular disease is the absence of the child's father. And there could be many reasons why the absence is there. It could be the father's death. It could be the parent's divorce. It could be the workaholic daddy. It could be a daddy who is emotionally withdrawn and doesn't display care, attention, or affection to his little girl. She, in turn, in her undeveloped reasoning, interprets this absence as rejection or abandonment and wonders why she has been singly expelled from her father's life and denied his gifts. The best thing in her immaturity she can come up with is that she is not worthy of her father's attention or that she is in some way defective or unlovable or deficient in some quality that her father admires. So what does she do? She blames herself and promptly proceeds to hide the pain, burying the pain and at the same time wishing to earn her father's attention, but not having the faintest idea on how to do this. So she compromises her integrity. She compromises her self-worth. She compromises her self-esteem. And the pain, which is a consequence of her sense of loss, becomes a prime mover of her existence. Pretty soon, it begins to control every facet of her life. Father Nostalgia might react with aggression and suspicion to a neutral or even a positive remark. Everything becomes tainted with the possibility of another loss. The book identifies five, five characteristics of the fatherless woman syndrome. The first is called the unfactor. Everybody say unfactor. The fatherless daughter feels unworthy, feels unlovable, and though she may have buried these feelings, her unconscious mind guides her into relationships and circumstances where she is connected to individuals that she doesn't even know why who are either unavailable or irresponsible. The second factor is called the triple fear factor. The fear of rejection, abandonment, and commitment. The fear of commitment is explained by so badly burned by her father or father surrogate, she is reluctant to experiment with commitment again. 
Perhaps this is one of the major reasons why so many today, when they get into marital relationships, as soon as certain things go wrong, they are no longer committed and ready to move on. The third factor is called sexual healing, which may range from promiscuity to abstinence, but the consistent element throughout is the lack of intimacy. In true intimacy, ladies and gentlemen, a person loses momentarily control of true intimacy, they make themselves vulnerable out of trust. The fatherless daughter knows that she absolutely has no control over her loss. So watch this. So she embarks on an endeavor to control all of her relationships and all of the circumstances in her life. This endeavor often gives rise to the fantasy that if I have my lover's baby, once he leaves me, I will always have a part of him in my life. But then when she has his baby, and that baby is a little boy, she doesn't raise him, she mothers him does everything for him, teaching him to be irresponsible so that when he becomes an adult, he would then look for a mommy to marry. And when he marries a young lady, watch this, who decides subconsciously to be his mother, she would work. She would take care of him, he would get a job or lose it, but she would continue the process, and then when she does not do what he wants, then he physically abuses her because he is now the immature child whose mommy is not doing what he wants. But then there's a little baby, his little girl. She doesn't mother her. She raises her. She raises her to be independent. Can I get a witness? Yeah. Because in the future, she has no idea that she might be a single parent herself. Wow. The author describes a fatherless daughter next as sometimes overachieving and overcompensating and sometimes crossing over into addictions not only like alcohol and drugs and food but the psychological ones like compulsions and obsessions and unfounded fear. And then the last one, the last one is called RAD, the acronym for Rage, Anger, and Depression. Anger, ladies and gentlemen, Turn outward, anger, turn inward. Now, our story. In our sermonic story today, we find a story of a little girl. Her name is Donna. What is her name? Donna. Donna has a mother. Her name is Leah. What is her name? Leah. And a father whose name is Jacob. What is his name? Jacob. Jacob. Let's start with Jacob. Jacob, a.k.a. Israel, whose father's name was Isaac, who had a problem with lying under pressure. Mm -hmm. Isaac's daddy was named Abraham, That's right. who had a problem lying under pressure. Right. Jacob's mommy was named Rebecca. Rebecca had a PhD in deception. <laughs> and her brother Laban seemed to graduate from the same school. <laughs> Jacob married Leah. History has not been kind to Leah. People have really put her down. But I want you to kind of really look at the picture of Leah. First of all, Leah was married to a man who did not want her. Mm. But not only did the man she married to didn't want her, but her daddy didn't want her either. Mm. So her daddy was trying to get rid of her. Now she's married to a man that doesn't even want her. 
Can you imagine honeymoon night? Daniel comes in. The tent is dark. He thinks there's Rachel. Yes. Mm -hmm. There all night long, whispering in her ear, singing Hebrew love songs to her. Mm. Then when the lovemaking is over, Jacob turns over and goes to sleep. But I imagine in my own mind that Leah stays awake all night long, hoping that the sun would never rise. Mm. But then as the sun began to make his track across the heavens, Jacob wakes up. Turns over to give his little old Rachel a kiss and looks into the cross eyes of her sister Leah. Mm -hmm. well, now we have Donna. Donna is young. Donna is curious. Curious about the customs of the women that live in the city next to the place where Jacob has pitched his camp. The city is called Shechem. And Shechem is one of the ancient capitals of the Canaanite religious center. It was here that Jacob experienced with his family social forces and cultural values that fundamentally altered the ethical sense from right and wrong within his own family. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 33 and verse 18 that Jacob pitched his tent before the city. That word city, coming from the Hebrew word er, or, which simply means that which initiates the drawing power of human curiosity and participation. That which feeds on the call of nature and breeds lust and licentiousness. Jacob miscalculated the impact of his decision and unwittingly subjected his family to an extremely worldly environment. In this story, it is important to note that a parent's own example or lack of presence in a child's life can create a setting for a spiritual downfall. The Hebrew writers not only hold Donna partly responsible for her rape, but also Leah, her mother, as well. The Bible says that Donna, the daughter of Leah, went out to visit the daughters of the land. This suggests in the Hebrew went out instead of went implies in the Hebrew that Donna went out looking for trouble. Where it says the phrase daughter of Leah instead of daughter of Jacob implies that Donna was acting like her mother. Wow. Are you with me so far? Hallelujah. Come on now, are you with me so far? Yeah. Simeon and Levi go into the city and they kill every man in the city. Rescue their little sister. Bring them home. But then this is what blew me out of the box. When they come before Jacob, he is more concerned with how people think about him than his own children. Whenever our children feel wrong, you cannot determine their response because in their anger, the consequence might be unbelievable. How many of us are here today that we have actually put our children or our friends or our close loved ones on a track to be hurt because of our behavior. I want you to look at me. How should we be able to handle when we have been broken? Not because of what we have done, but because what has been done to us. Did you hear what I just said? So I want you to look at it. And I want you to listen to what I'm saying. Some of us have been hurt beyond reason. Some have been hurt by your parents, others have been hurt by your spouses, others have been hurt by your siblings. And if the ones that have hurt us consider themselves religious, then it places a level of abuse on our lives that does not easily 
can't go away. Because they do it and they claim Jesus at the same time. And so what happens is that they put a stamp of religiosity and a level of spirituality on the abuse and it not only sinks in, but it stays in. So when you come to church, you don't like it here. But when you sit in church, you can't stand it because you know what has been done. And it makes you upset. But you know you can't leave the church. If I leave it, I'm going to be lost. And I'm, I'm torn between pain and pain and hurt and hurt. That's why God wants you to understand that he heals a broken heart. And he binds up the wounds. Because nobody knows what you have been through. Nobody understands the pain that you have experienced. You may react in certain ways. Others will look at you and shake their heads and suck their teeth and say, What is wrong with him? What is wrong with her? Well, I got news for you. Leave them alone. Because you don't know what has to happen to them. Can I get a witness, sir? Come on now. Can I get a witness, sir? There are some things. That only God can heal. There are some things that only God can turn around. There are some things that only God can rearrange. You can't help them. You're too mean. Sometimes some people, they are so mean, even when they smile, they look mean. <laughs> Can I get a witness? Yeah. When they smile, they cry. <laughs> That's why I want you to look at me. I'll shut this message down, but you got to pay attention. Because I want to give you some ways to get through some of the pain that you've been through. And I want you to know, don't you act like that your pain is greater than anybody else's pain. Because you have no idea. Come on with me. You have no idea. And the reason why some of us have been through some of the foolishness that we have been through is because the ones who have done it to us, somebody did it to them, somebody did it to them. But the bottom line is this. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of darkness and high places. So you got to make sure you hate the right thing. Yeah. Not about that person rolling their eyes at you. It's the spirit that's standing behind them. I got to testify to this. Sometimes you need haters in the church. Oh, yeah, that's right. Sometimes you need devils in the church. Because if everybody was happy, you wouldn't pray like y'all. Can I get a witness? Come on now, can I get a witness? Some of you stay on your knees because somebody's always messing in your life. Can I get a witness? Some of you stay on your knees. Sometimes we need that some of these people to mess with us so we can talk to God about it. So how should you handle them, haters? Invite them to your house and have dinner with them. Come on now. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, invite them to your house. Like, Come on over here. Come to my house. And they'll, be, they'll be so stunned. Mm, I don't know how to go here. They might put some in the food. <laughs> All right, here we go. What is the first step? Step number one. Don't forget this. The very first step is to realize that God is with you. That even though this has happened to you, God has not left you. Can I get a witness? And God will see you through. Are you with me out there? And the second step is this. You're going to have to be willing. Anybody say willing. willing. You've got to be willing. Anybody say willing. willing. You have to be willing to release the hurt and let it Go. Amen. Turn your neighbor and say, you got to let it go. Now watch me 
honest. Come on, look at me. Look at me honest. You cannot afford to let hurt stay because grudges are expensive. Did you hear what I just said? Grudges are what? Why are they expensive? Because of this. If you cannot forgive the person that has hurt you, you hold up God forgiving you for what you have done to yourself. Can I get a witness? So I want you to think about it. It's almost like a catch-22. It's like being between a rock and a hard place. Look at me. If I don't forgive that person, then the forgiveness I need to make it, I'm not going to get it. So I got to decide whether the person who has hurt me, I'm going to allow them to control my life so that I can end up in hell, or I let them go. Then God's forgiveness end up in heaven, and wherever they seek to go, they will no longer control me because I got my mind on oh, Jesus. Can I get a witness out there? Come on, can I get a witness out there? My mind is on God, and as long as He's in charge, the one that has hurt me, I let Him go. I release it because now I'm going to receive the forgiveness of the living God. Come on, can I get a witness, sir? Come on, can I get a witness, sir? But always remember this. Forgiveness does not mean reconciliation. Do you hear what I just said? What do I mean by that? Just because you forgive that person for what they did to you, they may act like, oh, I didn't do that. Oh, no, you talking about somebody else? Can I get a witness? And when they act like that, do not allow your emotions to rise up. You simply say to them, I forgive you. I have let it go. Then turn around and walk away. Amen. Come on, let me, come on. Let me hear you say amen. amen. Come on, say amen. amen. Let it go. Can I get a witness? The reason is because now that you have let it go, you have opened yourself up to receive more of the presence of God who can heal your broken heart, who can heal your wounds. Can I get a hallelujah, church? And I'm here to tell you, it is better to have his healing than have the devil's negativity all in your life. Now look at me. What happens when a person carries anger and negativity and hatred all their life? Get wrinkles? Can I get a witness? They always got to be by themselves. And always got something negative to say about somebody and everybody. Can I say it? Come on, let me say amen. Yeah. They live miserable lives. Some people, they are just so mean and think they're going to get to heaven. You say to yourself, man, if heaven's going to be like that, brother, that's just, oh, Lord Jesus, I'm going to go on to hell now. That's mercy. She'll be praying for a while eventually. The Lord sent us somebody. He was a Christian. He believed in the Lord. Had a good job. Oh, he had all the qualities. They got married for the next 25 years. They had a good life. But he got prostate cancer. When he went to the hospital, he waited too late. He died. Took her a while to get through this storm. And when she thought she was through the storm, her daughter came home from college after picking her up and getting home. They had to go to the grocery store and the daughter said, oh, can I go with you? She said, yes. They went to the grocery store and all the way back, their song came over the radio. I'm sure none of you have ever sung this song. But the song went something like this. A chair is still a chair, even when no one's sitting.
But a chair is not a house, and a house is not a home when there's no one there to hold you tight. And no one there to kiss you good night. That was their song. And when that song came on as she was driving, she kind of turned sideways. She didn't want her daughter to see the tears trickling down her cheeks. But they pulled in the driveway. The daughter came out, she got out, <clears throat> both of them pulled their seat up and they both reached in the back and grabbed a bag of groceries at the same time. All of a sudden there was a tug of war. The daughter was grabbing this way and mommy was grabbing this way. The daughter would pull it and mama would pull it. Daughter would pull it, mama would pull it. Until the daughter got upset and she said to her mama, Mommy, I can carry this, but you got to let it go. Jesus is saying this to us today. I can carry this. But you got to let it go. Right. Are you heads, please? As we move into our appeal of God, oh yes, your presence that is here. But you would give us an opportunity to let. It go. Release the pain of yesterday. Break those chains that remind us, that have caused us even to make the wrong choices. We need your help because you promise that you will heal the broken hearts and you will bind up our wounds so that every head is bowed and every eye closed I want you just to take a few seconds and just tell the Lord Lord this is what I need to let go and I need you to help me to do it Remind the Lord where you are and where you would like to be. <clears throat> Let him know that you really want to make heaven your home. You really want to be saved. But unless he decides to be king in your life and you open the door for him to be that king, then you will continue to spin your wheels. But today, you're going to let it go. As your heads are bowed, there's something that you really want to let go. Something that you want to release. And you want to do it this morning. I want you to bring that here to the altar. And we're going to leave it at the foot of the cross. So my first appeal is simple. If there's some things you need to let go, come on, let's let them go. I invite you to get up out of your seat. So I want you to bring that thing right here. And let's just leave it here at the altar. Just, just leave it. Just leave it right here. We're just going to leave it. Just going to let it go. If you're not going to come, I just want you to keep your eyes closed. Don't look around to try to identify who's coming down because it's between them and their God.
Let's just let it go. Let's, let's release it. Let's let it go. Let's say, Lord, I'm turning it over to you. And I'm giving it to you. You're still praying, church. You're still praying. Now, in addition, there are some who are here. Saying, Lord, I have strayed from you. And I have all kinds of excuses or reason why I've done this. But really, no excuse. I want to come back home. I want to come back home. I want to come back home. And so if you hear in the audience today, you want to come back to Christ, you want to come back to the church, I just want you to put your hand in the air and say, Lord, I want you to take me back by your grace. Just put your hand in the air. Just put it in the air. Just put it in the air. Just put it in the air. God bless you. I see your hand. Anyone else? God bless you. Put your hand back down. Anybody else? God bless you over here. Anybody else? Put your hand back in the air because we want to pray for you. We want to make sure. We want to give you something. Because we want to pray for you. We want to make sure that you're on the list. Just put your hand high in the air. I'm coming home. I want to come home. I want to come home. Just put your hand in the air. I know I need to make some changes and some adjustments. is moving in its way. All right. Everybody pray now. Those of you who come down to the front, come on, let's connect, let's connect, let's connect. Hold hands, let's connect. In the simplicity of this moment, We are grateful that your spirit has impacted our lives. Not to impact to hurt us, but to impact to love us, to draw us in, and then to hold us, and to whisper in our ears that we are not alone, we are not by ourselves. So these individuals who have walked down to the front, first they're saying, Jesus, I got a problem and I want to leave it with you. I got a burden and I want to take off my shoulders. I have a doubt that I do not understand. I have a question I can't find an answer for. And so I'm bringing it to the altar because you said, you said, though your ways are not my ways, and your thoughts are not my thoughts. You said, come unto me, all ye that lady, that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You said, whosoever thirsts, let him come and drink of the water of life free. So we have done this. We have drank from your fountain. And we are overflowing. And we say thank you. And we're leaving our situations at the altar. And we want to say thank you. Come on, church. We want to say thank you for what you are doing to us. David says, I will magnify the Lord at all times. Lord, we give you our praise. Thank you for touching these individuals. Give them your blessings when they walk out of here today. They will leave here with heaven's peace. In Jesus' name, we pray. Come on now. Let everybody say Amen. Amen.